Now, joining us is the, I can only describe him, he's an old friend of mine, he won't mind me saying so, the internet sensation. Dr. Ranjit Brar's common sense on coronavirus has swept the world. It certainly gained over 200,000, climbing towards a quarter of a million uh, uh, of an audience. Uh, and it was only, I think, uh, a short seven, eight minute interview. Uh, but because this uh, epidemic, pandemic, panic continues, we're going to keep going back to uh, Dr. Ranjit for an update on how it's all looking. Uh, indeed, we're creating a spin-off called Moats Medic and Dr. Ranjit is the Dr. Kildare de nos jours of the 21st century. Not many people, Ranjit, remember Dr. Kildare, but alas, I do. Welcome back. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. George, thanks so much for having us back on. Now, tell me, uh, since we last spoke last week, a lot more people have got this virus and a lot more people have died. Uh, were we right in the balance we struck last week? Do we need to adjust to any? Because, of course, when facts change, so must our opinions. That's right, George. I think that's a, a, a reasonable point. Um, overall, I think the balance really hasn't changed dramatically. What has changed is where the highest risk areas are. Um, initially, we thought of this as an outbreak centering around Wuhan, and 95% of the cases were there. Um, I read a very interesting report by the European CDC, so an EU institution similar to the CDC, Center for Disease Control in the United States. Um, they'd actually sent a delegation over to China um, and seen how they coped with the outbreak. And I've got to say it was a, it was a, a glowing report, a report really at odds with much of the tone of the media coverage. And, and really, we're reaching the end of the bell curve in China. You know, initially, there's a propagation phase with these uh, infections, where it seems that more and more people are getting it, seems to be spreading at an exponential rate. And that seemed to be, and that was spreading the initial panic. Certainly, the United States, and not the only country, has stopped travel with China, and really using the situation to try and advance its program of sanctions with China. The ECDC struck a much more sober tone, apart from, you know, the obvious things that we've already commented on. Like, amazing, really, to see, one, the virus identified in sequence so soon, that sequence shared with the world, the simple 10 base pairs being the basis for ongoing research into um, a vaccine, uh, more of that later, but also their drug trials and showing uh, um, that with adequate hospital care, categorizing the risk of the patients into low risk who could self-isolate at home, slightly more seriously ill patients, and they created mass wards where they could be infected and cared for by teams who were themselves increasingly well protected from the infective agent. And then lastly, recognizing a small cohort. So really, 5% of the patients who got a much more serious illness. And it's these ones who are getting the lower respiratory tract infection, uh, the whiteout of the lungs that you classically see with this ground glass of pacification on CT and, and plain radiograph film. And it's those ones who have these SARS, the, the severe uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome type picture. What's interesting to see is that actually, if anything, it's become probably less dangerous than we had initially thought. Uh, so if you look at the World Health Organization, they're still using overall uh, a figure of around 3% mortality, which is very high and considerably higher than flu, which would be around 0.1, 0.2%. But if you look at the, lo the latest, so the last cases in China, when it was well recognized and being treated aggressively, including with anti-viral uh, anti medication, which we'll come to a bit later on, um, th th that, that mortality has fallen considerably, and probably 0.6 or 0.7 is a closer figure. So, I mean, that's the positive thing. The other, the other very simple step that China took was very rigorous contra uh, contact tracing. So they're able to mobilize their health system, mobilize their resources to make sure that every positive result was rigorously traced. Everyone they met with and every single one of those people was isolated pending uh, the results of whether or not they had in fact contracted the virus. And it was those measures in particular, you know, effective quarantining, closing down um, ex, you know, unusual, um, well, interstate transportation, um, closing down, obviously, the epicenter of the virus, but rigorous contact tracing and concentration in specifically designed and rapidly fashioned hospitals that 
had amazing effect in China. That's not been mirrored, unfortunately, in other countries. Well, definitely not. Uh, but before I leave that point, uh, someone wrote in. It was a bit of uh, uh, it was a bit of a non sequitur, really, because I had been praising the construction of rapidly construction of the hospitals, the ten day, twelve day hospitals. Uh, they pointed out that in Guangzhou, uh, uh, an isolation uh, hotel had fallen down. Had that been rapidly built, or was that a longer standing structure? Do you know about that? I'm afraid I can't comment on that, George. I don't have information about that, and that's not come to my attention. But if I find, I'll, I'll look into it, and if um, I see you again, I'll see what I can dig up on so it. I'm, I'm being told in my ear it was an old one, and therefore has nothing to do with the rapid construction of the hospitals. That's all worked well, I infer from what you say. Yes, indeed. Now, uh, how are we doing on a vaccine? Who will make this vaccine? Will China get there first? Or will the American uh, uh, Big Pharma uh, get there and, and uh, make a hell of a profit out of giving it to each of us? That's an interesting point, George. So um, along with the gene sequencing, the genes themselves code for proteins. Um, there's only 10 genes, 10 distinct proteins. Uh, so it's really quite a simple organism in some respects. As we said before, virus is not a complete life form. One of those proteins is the so-called spike protein. I'm sure everyone's now seen pictures of the protein. Uh, coronaviruses are relatively large, spherical polyhedra, really, because they've got a repeating um, protein which makes up their coat, and then they have a lipid layer, and they have a transmembrane domain, and sticking out from that is a large spike protein. I'm sure you've seen, uh, hence the name, really, corona looking like the sun, and not, incidentally, corona uh, like the beer. Uh, interestingly, in the United States, uh, the, the corona beer is absolutely tanked in terms of its sale because of confusion about uh, that point in that it's terminology. An which it's says, an ill wind that blows nobody any good. <laughs> Here we go on. <laughs> so it's rather more about a public perception than the, than the virus itself. But that protein is very likely to be the target um, as, a, as a specific antigen which would be available for a vaccine. It has to be careful with vaccine development that um, you, have, um, you need an antigen, so part of that protein, which is not found within the human organism. So that when you opsonize, when you target that particular point on the virus, that that doesn't cause immune reaction also towards the host organism in the body. And therefore, you know, there, there are a, a series of ascending trials, phase one, phase two, phase three trials, in order to get up to a, vi a, 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 um, a vaccine which is commercially viable, which is actually safe for the general public. I think, you know, organizations within China, the, the medical um, uh, establishment in China, the medical organizations in China are working on that. It's quite clear that Sanofi, um, Pfizer, various, so there are five major um, health firms in the United States who between them essentially have a, a monopoly on, on uh, vaccine production. It's very clear that they are extremely keen on working on that. Um, in a sense, that's not a, a new, I think Boris also visited um, a British laboratory where he was um, saying the government would give some money towards that development. There's no way on earth that's going to be ready immediately, probably not for a year or a year and a half with a, a reasonable estimate. And that's a very accelerated estimate in itself. That would be unusually quick. So it's not going to be a vaccine which saves us from this outbreak. It is really the more simple measures of existing antiviral medication and carefully self-isolating, contact tracing, and trying to stop the spread in that manner. You know, in fact, if you look at the job China's done, they've managed to limit, you know, they're about 1.4 billion population, they've managed to limit the virus, and now it really is in its declining phase, uh, to less than half of one hundredth of one percent of the population. And that's in a really stark contrast to the um, prediction that was given by Matt Hancock, our own health secretary, who almost blurted out, it seemed, in, in the interview, that, that we'd probably end up with an 80 percent of the British public being affected. And it's a, quite a reach from the current situation, where still there are less than 200 people who have the virus. And it should be possible to contain the virus and stop a generalized spread. Let me ask you a, 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 a trivial for a man of your standing. Um, in the football today, uh, the players were not allowed to shake hands with each other. Mm. even though they were playing in a stadium with 80,000 people breathing 
viruses and other germs uh, at them. Do you think this kind of thing is such an overreaction uh, that we should see less of it? Uh, yeah, I, have, I have mixed feelings. I mean, there's nothing wrong with telling people to be careful that there's a high risk situation. You know, no one, if you really want a video to go viral, George, I'm mean, very pleased with the response that, that I had from my colleagues, friends, family who've seen this video. But if you really want something to go viral, it seems that you really have to do is take a video of you carefully washing your hands in the appropriate manner. It seems that we all know how to wash our hands, um, whether we sing the national anthem or happy birthday while we're doing it. Uh, but, but, you know, we can all judge that washing our hands is a safe thing to do. And yet there is research that shows, you know, we have a, a lax attitude towards basic hygiene, essentially because our everyday life experience shows us that risk is relatively low with the met levels of hygiene we tend to use. So, you know, President Trump coming out and saying that he hasn't been touching his face for <laughs> several uh, weeks now, uh, and us encouraging us not to touch our mucous membranes, I think it's reasonable, you know, that the, the virus will get into the human body through mucous membranes, through coughs and sneezes. So coughs and sneezes cause diseases, you know, sneezing into a tissue, sneezing into your arm, throwing that away, w washing very rigorously. I think all of those are perfectly reasonable things to do. But there, there comes a point when, you know, you do start to panic monger. I, you know, I said last time when I was with you that the tube and other large crowd, crowded areas probably would be high risk areas if we come to the stages of a pandemic. And I must say, there's a palpably different atmosphere uh, when you travel through London with people quite clearly slightly nervous of, you know, interpersonal contact. And that is really an effect of the media hype surrounding this infection, which is like no other media hype that I've ever seen regarding any other infection, which is not to underplay the seriousness you know, of the situation. Well, uh, finally, uh, President Trump may not be touching his face as much as before, but he did shake the hand of someone at a right-wing conservative conference uh, just the other day who is now a confirmed sufferer of coronavirus. The impact on the United States I'm making a guess here. You're the expert. I actually think this could be pretty devastating for the United States. It's already set the stock market tumbling. May actually end up costing President Trump a second term. What do you think? Um, I think, if, you know, great play has been made. I mean, I saw Alex Azar, who was the U.S. Health Secretary, being... Uh, cross-examined, if you like, by a congressional committee. Uh, and Marco Rubio was one of those notoriously right-wing senator who stood against Trump in the first round, who was cross-examining him, and was constantly making the point that, you know, 80% of our medicines and the precursors to make our medicines come from China, and trying to use the situation of an outbreak of a health problem in China to change that, to enforce their pre-existing program of furthering sanctions, furthering the trade war. And certainly that's been the case with Iran. You know, the, the, the foreign secretary of Iran has come out and said, at this time, when we need help, when we need aid, the United States is ramping up the sanctions. And those are certainly despicable things. But actually, if you look at the way China's dealt with it, the, the way it was commended by, as I say, the European CDC, and not an institution you could um, accuse of harboring any great you know, sympathy for socialism, communism, or China, whichever of those you think it is. Um, you know, their report and their glowing report of how China coped with it will not be reflected in the United States. The United States may well be, you know, in the worst position to deal with such an outbreak. As you know, there are 40, 50, 60 million cases of flu every year. But as you were saying, I think quite reasonably in our last interview, if you're a United States worker who's lucky enough to have a job, you know, if you're self-employed, there's very little social safety net. We know there are 50 million people in the United States who have no insurance and therefore very little access to health care. But beyond that, actually, the insured themselves, you know, Bob Gill's excellent uh, movie, um, which I really think everyone should watch, which is called The Great NHS Heist, points out that this is the direction in which currently and unchecked our own health system is moving. It's moving towards an insurance based uh, system. And we touched on that again last time. But if you're in that situation, not only are you, do you end up with a, a large percentage of the population who have no health cover, the ones who do have health cover have uh, what they call deductibles. So they have to meet a certain, like when you crash your car, you have to pay out 500 or 1,000 pounds before the insurance company pay out. The same thing for your health. And that forms an enormous barrier. So there are people who have turned up, you know, for testing um, you know, for, for COVID-19. 
and found that they met with a bill, even though they're negative, of three, four thousand dollars, which is prohibitive. Um, if you see then people in our own country who come into some something like a similar situation, you know, they are on zero hours contracts or self-employed. They can't actually afford to be unwell and self-isolate. They can't afford not to present to the DSS. So that actually, you know, this decision, which should be a straightforward medical decision, stay at home to prevent a wider health problem and a wider economic problem if you disable a larger portion of the working population, you know, there's a fundamental conflict with actually the, the economic modus operandi of our society. And increasingly, you know, I meet patients, they come to me, they're having elective operations, and they're very anxious about the period of time they'll have to spend off work. And they ask me, you know, very few people now have that level of social safety net where they feel they could happily take two weeks or a month off work. And there's a very good video, which I think, uh, you know, is worth seeing. It's already had hundreds of thousands of hits. It's a diary um, of a frontline, quite heroic frontline worker in China in Wuhan area, a nurse who from the early days caught the virus because they didn't yet know exactly how to contain it, though their methods got better and better. And you can, it's a beautiful human story, but you can see that she, through self-isolation, was able to cure herself and get herself better just with, again, I think she had some antiviral medication. What's the name of that, doctor? The course of her illness was about 10 days, 12 days, two weeks, and then she probably needed another week off. But there are not, there are many, many workers, both within the United States and Britain, where that would mean a huge challenge to their finances, possibly even they're unable to repay their mortgage. And of course, that means further problems with homelessness. Possibly, you know, so the crisis caused by what should be a simple medical matter goes well beyond just the extent of the severity of the illness, though clearly that is on people's mind at present. Crystal clear, as always. Thank you very much. Moats Medic, Dr. Ranjit Brar.